Thank you for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Nick, and I'm one of the event hosts here at Powell's Books. Before we begin, I just want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. One of the many events we're looking forward to is forest ecologist Suzanne Simard in conversation with OPB's Erin Scott about her new book, Finding the Mother Tree, on Wednesday, May 5th. If you don't, don't already do so, please consider following us on social media. Tonight, we are so excited to welcome Patrick Radden Keefe and Lydia Polgreen. Patrick Radden Keefe is a staff writer at the New, York, New York, the New Yorker and author of the New York Times bestseller, Say Nothing, a true story of murder and memory in Northern Ireland, which received the National Book Critics Circle Award for nonfiction, was selected as one of the 10 best books of 2019 by the New York Times Book Review, Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, and the Wall Street Journal, and was named one of the top 10 nonfiction books of the decade by Entertainment Weekly. His previous books are The Snakehead and Chatter. His work has been recognized with the Guggenheim Fellowship, the National Magazine Award for Feature Writing, and the Orwell Prize for Political Writing. He is also the creator and host of the eight-part podcast, Wind of Change. Keith's new book, Empire of Pain, is a grand, devastating portrait of three generations of the Sackler family, famed for their philanthropy, whose fortune was built by Valium and whose reputation was destroyed by Oxycontin. The Sackler name adorns the walls of many storied institutions, Harvard, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Oxford, the Louvre. They are one of the richest families in the world, known for their lavish donations to the arts and the sciences. The source of the family fortune was vague, however, until it emerged that the Sacklers were responsible for making and marketing a blockbuster painkiller that was the catalyst for the opi opioid crisis. In Empire of Pain, Keith chronicles the multiple investigations of the Sacklers and their company and the scorched earth legal tactics that the family has used to evade accountability. The history of the Sackler dynasty is rife with drama, baroque personal lives, bitter disputes over estates, fist fights in the boardrooms, glittering art collections, Machiavellian courtroom maneuvers, and the calculated use of money to burnish reputations and crush the less powerful. Empire of Pain is a masterpiece of narrative reporting on the excesses of America's second gilded age, a study of impunity among the super elite and a relentless investigation of the naked greed and indifference to human suffering that built one of the world's greatest fortunes. Joining Keith in conversation this evening is Lydia Polgreen. Polgreen is an award-winning journalist who currently runs Gimlet, a podcast studio at Spotify. Prior to that, Paul Green served as an editor-in-chief at HuffPost, following a 15-year career at the New York Times that included roles as editor and bureau chief in Africa and India. Paul Green was a 2006 recipient of the George Polk Award for Foreign Reporting and the 2008 Livingston Award for International Reporting. This evening's event will include an audience Q&A. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question. As well, if someone has typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, please upvote that particular question by clicking the thumbs up button. Most importantly, please consider supporting Patrick and Powell's by purchasing a copy of his new book from us. A link to buy Empire of Pain will be shared in the chat a couple of times this evening. Patrick, Lydia, it is a pleasure to welcome you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, I will apologize in advance for my dogs who may bark. This is the uh, reality of life in COVID. And uh, speaking of life in COVID, Patrick, how are you feeling? I'm okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm doing all right. Um, I, should, I should warn uh, those of you who don't know, I was diagnosed with COVID on Monday now uh, at this point in the game. Um, but the good news is I had already had one shot, so it's a pretty mild case. I, I do want to warn you, though, just in case I need to mute myself and cough, which is going to happen from time to time, and I'll be guzzling water. Apart from that, no complaints at all. I'll, I'll fill the space uh, while, while you silently cough. No, no problem at all. Well, huge congrats on the book. It's um, incredibly exciting. Um, you know, I feel like we've had a we've I've been a big admirer of your work for a very long time and um, and loved um, say nothing. Um, this this new book I was curious 
What made you decide to take on the story of the opioid crisis through the lens of a, of a dynasty? Um, why, why tell a family story? I mean, there's the addicts, you know, you could, you could, you could approach it through the, the people whose lives have been lost, uh, you know, the company itself. Why, why tell it through a family story? Well, because to me, that was the, the most intriguing story, um, you know, both as a, as a story, as a, um, a kind of a way into a larger set of complex issues, um, and also because I'm interested in uh, moral choices that people make. I'm interested in, in telling stories about people and, and the decisions they make and the, uh, the way in which they either wrestle or don't with those decisions and the, and the downstream consequences of those decisions. So in some ways, this book was very, very different from my last book, which was about a, a series of members of the Irish Republican Army. Um, but in that respect, it was pretty similar in that I was trying to tell a story of a handful of people um, and some momentous decisions they made and the impact that those decisions had on the world. Um, you start out the, um, the book uh, talking about Arthur Sackler, who is the eldest of the three Sackler brothers. Um, he, he, he as, as we learn in the book, dies before the development of, of OxyContin, but you sort of lay a foundation for the story that you're going to tell in telling the story of, of Arthur Sackler and the kind of uh, fortune that he built for himself um, even before OxyContin came into the world. Can you kind of tell us, um, tell us who was Arthur Sackler and, and what was his big innovation? Yeah, absolutely. So the story, um, there's, a, there's a brief prologue at the beginning of the book that takes place quite, quite recently at a law firm in, in New York City, um, at which point there are already thousands of lawsuits involving OxyContin, this painkiller, and the opioid crisis. Um, but then it, it tracks back pretty quickly to Brooklyn in 1913 and the birth of this, uh, this boy, this oldest son, Arthur Sackler. He was, <clears throat> excuse me, the son of, um, of immigrants uh, who had come over from, from Europe not much longer before that. And um, he, he grew up in this family with three boys. He had two younger brothers, uh, Mortimer and Raymond. And they grew up poor uh, during the Great Depression, or, or rather they grew up middle class and then their parents' fortunes kind of slipped during the Depression. And um, so he developed this very kind of entrepreneurial sensibility from a very early age. Uh, he was devoted to education, but also working all kinds of jobs on the side. He's very, very creative. Um, and he later said that by the age of four, he knew he would be a doctor, that there was a real kind of, uh, I think particularly his mother, Sophie, had, was a very forceful personality and wanted all three of her sons to be physicians. And so uh, Arthur did become a doctor, as did his brothers. He became a psychiatrist. But he had this kind of, I think it was a combination of a very restless intellect, um, a, a sense that like no one profession could really contain him or satisfy him, and also a desire to make a lot of money, um, which I think was, it was not driven by greed per se, it was driven by the fact that, you know, from the age of from the time he was in, in middle school, he had been working to support his family. Um, and there had been a kind of an ethic instilled in him that that's what the oldest son does. He takes care of his parents, he takes care of his younger brother, his younger brothers. And so there was this sense that he needed to, to acquire wealth. Um, so he, he does a bunch of things. He does psychiatric research. He becomes a very big believer in the, the possibilities of new pharmaceuticals. This is kind of the era of the wonder drug. Um, and in the 1950s, he, he takes this kind of, he's had this sort of side hustle for years writing advertising copy for pharmaceutical companies. And he takes over a, a medical advertising firm and in pretty short order revolutionizes the field of medical advertising. Um, so he's this kind of Don Draper kind of figure with this like very intuitive grasp of how you sell medication, not just to consumers, but also, and, and much more importantly, to physicians. That he's a doctor and you're selling to doctors, that it's the physician who's writing the prescriptions that's your real target. And um, he's quite brilliant. I mean, I think he's a genius. Uh, I, I interviewed a bunch of very old men who worked with him in the 1950s, and they all regard him as having, um, in, in the words of, of, of one of these old guys, you know, they say he invented the wheel. Um, 
and he kind of brings his younger brothers uh, not into the medical advertising business, but into the pharmaceutical business, buying them this Greenwich Village medicine company called Purdue Frederick, which ends up becoming Purdue Pharma. Um, but I was fascinated by Arthur. He's just this kind of protean, uh, creative, inexhaustible character with just huge ambition to leave a mark on the world. And so it was a, you know, it was a significant choice for me. I, I always thought this is not a book just about OxyContin or the opioid crisis. It was a big choice to devote a third of the book to this guy who dies in 1987. Um, but I feel as though he's not extraneous at all. If you look at Arthur's life, um, almost everything that happens later in, with the story of OxyContin and the younger generations, um, there is some uh, kind of predicate for in the life of Arthur Sackler. The, the playbook for how uh, for how OxyContin is ultimately um, marketed um, essentially was set with um, with these 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 tranquilizer drugs, and um, at that time I think there were these psycho, psych, psychiatric medicines. There was there was this belief that um, you know tranquilizers were heavy drugs that you gave to people with major psychiatric disorders, but there was this innovation of these like quote unquote lighter drugs that could be taken by anybody, and 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 that was a, a real innovation this idea that you know you could take one happy pill and all of your all of your 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 stress and mental strain would go away yeah totally so there's this so there's this fascinating interlude at the beginning of the story where arthur and his brothers all end up working at the same uh uh insane asylum in queens new york um the creedmoor institute and it's this kind of vast you know dickensian establishment with thousands of people who are locked in basically and spend their whole lives uh, <clears throat> confined in these wards. And there are these very brutal methods for, um, for addressing issues, you know, psychotic patients, people suffering from schizophrenia and so forth. Um, Arthur Sacker and his brothers have to perform thousands of electroshock treatments, um, which they find very demoralizing and barbaric. Uh, the lobotomy comes into vogue during this period of time. And so initially there's this very kind of idealistic sense that Arthur has that, that there's got to be a better way. Uh, there has to be some sort of psychobiological thing, some chemical uh, component that you could isolate and then treat with, with chemistry. Um, and sure enough, you eventually get, it's not Arthur, he has nothing to do with it, but you get Thorazine and the and this, this very powerful antipsychotic drug, which is a tranquilizer, it's a strong tranquilizer, um, which can help people suffering from, um, you know, people, people who are psychotic. So when Arthur's in medical advertising, uh, what happens is you start getting the development of, as you say, the, the minor tranquilizers, where basically these pharma companies, and in, in Arthur's case, notably, it's, it's Roche, which was a big client for him, they kind of look around and they say, well, Thorazine, you know, there's only so much of a market for Thorazine because it's, it's this really heavy duty solution. But what if we had like Thorazine light, um, which would be good for anybody who's suffering from a little anxiety, a uh, little depression, a little stress. And so <coughs> the, the first of the, of the so-called minor tranquilizers is a drug called Milltown. It's a huge success. Um, and it becomes kind of a party drug. It's like, it's very, lots and lots of people are taking, it's fashionable to take it. Um, and then next up, Roche develops Librium, which becomes hugely successful. And Arthur Sackler devises the advertising campaign for Librium. And so um, the idea basically is you, at the time you weren't allowed to advertise directly to consumers. So he finds ways around that. They, they place an editorial article in Life Magazine, the biggest magazine of the day, which is uh, you know somebody writing about tests of Librium on animals. Um, but this is like on the eve of them being ready to release the drug for humans and Arthur's PR people were there every step along the way. Um, they uh, build up this sales force that is gonna go out and talk to doctors and kind of hand sell this drug to doctors. They arm the sales force with all this medical literature, which looks very official. Um, but in fact, a lot of it is pretty dubious. I mean, it, it makes a very wide variety of claims about the things that Librium can do. 
um, and really downplays uh, the potential addictiveness, for instance, but any, any downsides or side effects associated with it. Librium comes out, it's a huge success. And almost immediately, uh, Roche then rolls out Valium. Um, same principle, actually same inventor, uh, even more successful. And they have both drugs going. Arthur Sackler, he doesn't get points on these drugs, but he had negotiated a deal where he would get an escalating series of bonuses based on the volume of pills sold. And these drugs become the best-selling pharmaceutical products in the history of the world. Um, so he gets incredibly wealthy uh, with the marketing of these drugs, which subsequently turn out to be actually more addictive and have a whole series of, of negative side effects than, uh, that, that, you know, that certainly Arthur and Roche didn't acknowledge when they put them on the market in the first place. So the eldest brother kind of sets the pattern um, and he buys this, this, this um, pharmaceutical company for his brothers. Um, and ultimately um, uh, that, that company was manufacturing, I think some very boring drugs, some laxatives and, um, and, and other types of, of medications that weren't particularly uh, glamorous or successful. Um, tell, tell us the story of, of how Purdue Frederick came to be in the business of, of painkillers. So yeah, as you say, I mean, they, for years they had, I mean, they were relatively successful, but they had these just very kind of, these over-the-counter staples. There was, a, there was a laxative was one of their biggest products, Seneca. Um, they had a, uh, an antiseptic solution that they sold. They had an earwax remover. Um, it was these really kind of humdrum products that were, were again, they reliably, you know, turned over a profit, um, but they weren't setting the town on fire. And <clears throat> the, the Sacklers, one of the brothers, Mortimer, who is the kind of international playboy brother who, you know, moves to Europe really at the first opportunity and kind of divides his time between London and Paris and Stad and, you know, the south of France. Um, and he started sort of setting up all these international businesses and they bought a, uh, a British pharmaceutical company called Knapp and started doing kind of interesting R&D there. And you have this, this fascinating moment where <clears throat> there was a, 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 around this time in the 1970s now we're talking, uh, there were some physicians who felt that um, the, tr the treatment of pain was an area in which medical practice, certainly in the UK and the US, was, was really sorely deficient. That doctors didn't really think about pain. They thought of pain as a symptom of, of other problems, but they never thought of pain actually as a condition itself that should be treated. And as a consequence, many, many people were suffering from terrible undertreated pain. And morphine had been a very reliable uh, tr treatment for pain for a long time. Uh, morphine, a, a drug which is an opioid, which means it's derived from the opium poppy. Um, but there was a reluctance often to, to administer morphine because it was sort of associated with death. It was thought of as like a kind of last stage thing. There were fears about it being addictive. And it was also often administered by shot or by IV drip. So one of these doctors approached NAP in the UK and said, hey, what if you developed a pill? a morphine pill. And Knapp developed this very novel kind of groundbreaking coating for their pill, which they called Contin. And it's, it's just the seal on the pill. And they developed a morphine pill with this seal. And what that did was slowly regulated the flow of the drug into your bloodstream over a, over a series of hours. So they developed this pill, this morphine pill called MS Contin, and it became a huge success. And they ended up uh, releasing that here in the U.S. And at this point, already the, the kind of older generation, Mortimer and Raymond Sackler, were still running Purdue, but there's a younger generation, which is there, several of their children who are kind of coming to the fore, particularly Raymond's son, Richard Sackler, and they were really there kind of at the vanguard of this shift to pain management. 
And at the time, there was, as you said, there was this kind of stigma around the use of opioids. Um, this idea of using there was there, there were sort of two problems, right? There was, the, you know, the idea that 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 pain wasn't taken very seriously, and you had people who were suffering from you know quite serious chronic pain, and in a philosophy of of treating people for acute pain, usually associated with 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 cancer. With, with a morphine drip, but there are people who had longer term pain, or you know, if you if you had acute pain, you had to be in the hospital to get a morphine drip. So there was this kind of pain management movement and this you know um, movement around hospice care and end of life. Um, I, I think that the that the that the 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 Sackler family in some ways kind of like grafted onto that and 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 found ways to use that movement um, to their own commercial ends. I think that's exactly right. And it's, and, and th this is part of what makes this such an exquisitely tricky problem is that it is, it is not untrue that pain was, was undertreated at that time. I mean, you know, I think a, a, a correction was probably very much warranted, but what, what happened was that you got a kind of perfect storm of pain patients, uh, doctors who were specializing in pain and concerned with with these issues and had a real you know sincere belief that um, for instance that opioids should be used more widely uh, they also often had a belief that opioids were, were not as addictive as people had previously believed that there was a kind of hysteria around opioids and then you had this huge juggernaut which is the pharma industry and and it was really you know led by Purdue. Purdue was always, I mean, I, I should say, Purdue was not the only company to sell or promote strong opioids, but they were the company that um, very systematically sat down and said, there's a, there's a pretty pronounced aversion among American physicians to prescribing strong opioids to just anyone and for moderate pain. And um, we think they should be prescribing more. They're not doing so because they think these drugs are too dangerous. We need to persuade them that they're not, that they're actually not addictive. So that's a, we kind of have the receipts on that. That was a, uh, a game plan that was, was dreamed up and brilliantly executed uh, by Purdue. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's this tricky thing. And even today, you have this situation where now, all these decades later, with so many people dead, um, you now have, some would argue, a, a kind of overcorrection going in the other direction where you have some chronic pain patients who now worry, I hear from them all the time, that, that they're going to be deprived of their, uh, you know, their prescriptions, um, of, of their medicine that they rely on to, to get through each day. Um, and it's incredible because the, you know, on some level, I feel as though they've been, they've been sort of, it's like they were used on the way in and used on the way out. Um, you know, it was, I, I don't think it was really ever uh, genuinely in any kind of undiluted sense, the interests of these pain patients that were at the forefront of, of, of anyone's thinking, certainly in the, in the, in the Sackler family or in Purdue. And um, we'll, we'll get to it, but you, you certainly have receipts on that. Um, lots of internal documents. I mean, the reporting in this, in this book is really just extraordinary. Um, so MS Contin, it's, it's basically morphine with a special coating on it. It goes on the market. It's a huge success, but it's, it's really just limited to, you know, to, to cancer patients. Um, Eventually, this thing happens where you know you, you lose your patent, right? You only have you only have exclusive access in the pharma industry to be able to manufacture a medicine for a certain amount of time, um, and so um, Richard Sackler, the son, um, and and his his colleagues come up with a. Um, I don't know, I guess you could call it a brilliant plan, uh, but ultimately very tragic plan for how uh, Purdue was going to, um, to, to, to keep this, 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 uh, this opioid boom, boom going. What, what, what happened next? Uh, yeah, so you had this, um, this amazing moment where the patent is running out. Um, they know that that's gonna be catastrophic for their profits. And so they start talking about, well, what else could we develop here. And the move that they come up with is actually very similar to the move from the major tranquilizers to the minor tranquilizers in the sense that they have these conversations and they say, look, I mean, the cancer market's great. We've made a lot of money, but it's kind of limited. There's only so many people who have cancer pain. 
um, what if we developed something that was for uh, moderate pain in addition to severe pain? Um, so then you're talking about you know, their estimates of the number of people suffering from undiagnosed or undertreated moderate to severe pain with you know, 40 million people for, for potentially across the country. That's the jackpot. And the, the, they choose to kind of to keep that content coding. The question is, what else can we put in there? And they come up with the idea of using oxycodone, which is another old opioid. It had been around since the beginning of the century. Um, and they would basically sub out the, the morphine and replace it with oxycodone and then market this drug, which becomes known as oxycontin, to a much, much broader range of people than MS content was marketed to. The wrinkle is that um, whereas the minor tranquilizers were, were weaker than Thorazine, oxycodone is actually stronger than morphine. And you have these, I mean, some of the most amazing documents that I, I found as I was working on this book are these internal emails among very senior people in the company leadership, including Richard Sackler where they talk about the fact that they've done focus groups and they're hearing from doctors and they realize that doctors actually don't know that much about oxycodone. Um, they, they, the only real exposure they have to it is that oxycodone in very small amounts is in Percodan and Percocet to uh, you know, mild painkillers that you may have taken where it's, it's cut with acetaminophen or aspirin, which means there's only so much that you can take of it. Um, but what they realize is that doctors are under the mistaken impression that oxycodone is weaker than morphine. But in fact, they know it's stronger. And there are these unbelievable emails where they say, if we wanna reach that big market, we need to be very careful not to do anything that would make those doctors realize they're wrong about the product that we're selling. We want them to continue in the misunderstanding you know, thinking that it's weaker. And so that's the, that's the idea was to, um, to push Oxycontin on those terms to as broad a population as possible and to do so with, with a whole series of dubious marketing claims, but the, the, the chief among them that the drug isn't addictive, that in fact, it's a myth that opioids are addictive, um, that if, you t if you're a pain patient and you take it as prescribed by a doctor, uh, what they would say is that it's addictive less than 1% of the time. There was no real scientific basis for saying this, but I've interviewed a bunch of former Purdue sales reps who said that for years they went out and just met with thousands and thousands of doctors and all day long they would say less than 1% of the time, less than 1% of the time, less than 1% of the time, and they would make that assurance. Um, so they were, you know, they were kind of fraudulently selling this drug and it, it worked. It worked fantastically well. Well, and, and um, I think one of the one of the underlying themes of this book that just comes through so powerfully is the is the way in which the institutions that normally would um, would would be looking out for the public interest um, really kind of fell down on the job um, in the approval process for for for. Um, for OxyContin, uh, you report on um, the way that uh, Purdue developed and the Sackler family developed a relationship with the um, the FDA official responsible for examining um, examining this uh, or for basically running the process of that approval. What, what happened? So there's this guy at the FDA named Curtis Wright, uh, who was the chief official at the Food and Drug Administration in charge of not just approving um, OxyContin as a drug that could be sold, uh, but also approving the specific terms of the, the way in which it could be marketed. Um, so to give you an example, there ends up being a claim on the, um, uh, in the, the package insert that comes with each bottle that says, it is believed that the special contin coding reduces the abuse liability of the drug. That is to say, this is, this is probably gonna be harder to abuse than other painkillers that might be out there and, and be competition for us, which from a marketing point of view is a great claim to be able to make. Um, but it, it's, it, it had no basis. In fact, it's a weird thing to say, like it is believed, it's believed by who, you know? And the strangest thing is today in 2021, uh, nobody can say who wrote that line. Um, 
people from Purdue Pharma say that it must have been the FDA. People at the FDA say it must have been Purdue Pharma. It's literally this line of text that crept into the FDA approved description of this drug that has no author that nobody will own today. But this guy, Curtis Wright, oversees that. He signs off on that. For all we know, he may have written the line of text and approves the drug in record time and then decides he's going to leave the FDA. And within a year, he goes and works at Purdue uh, for a, a, his first year compensation package was three times what he was making in the government. It was about $400,000. Wow. wow. Um, another sort of way that I think um, there was this kind of corruption of institutions was that the, the Sacklers had all of these kind of beliefs about um, the infallibility, for example, of doctors, that, that doctors were, weren't susceptible to marketing in the way that ordinary people would be. And it, 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 it's interesting, there were several times where you report on these notions that um, doctors couldn't possibly be influenced by marketing. And if anyone is approved, uh, abusing the drug, it's because they're an addict and that was their original constitution. Um, where did these ideas come from? And, and how, did they, how, did the, how did the Sacklers sort of imbibe this as a set of beliefs that, 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 that allowed them to, to do what they did? I'm so glad you picked up on that because um, it's such a weird feature of this. I mean, some of it is you look at these different family members and this is not a family that gets along. I should say, I mean, there are different wings of the family. There's feuds, there's people who have grudges for, don't speak to each other for years. Um, and yet there are these continuities, these kind of weird themes that get repeated again and again across the generations. And one of them is this idea of doctors as a kind of unimpeachable priesthood um, who you know, would never be swayed by anything like greed or flattery, and they only think about um, the best interests of the patient and so forth. And Arthur Sackler just went on and on and on about this. I mean, it was, it was, he had a kind of boorish tendency to talk about the nobility of physicians. Um, but the paradox, right, is he, he ran an extremely successful medical advertising firm for years um, that, that was predicated on the idea that you could influence doctors. But he would say, it's not advertising, it's education. Um, and, and you, you see this pattern kind of play out where, um, you know, they would, uh, the, you'd get other Sacklers and, 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 the, and the company suggesting that, you know, we'll, we'll, of course we defer to the judgment of doctors and what have you. You'd have these moments where the company is aware that there's like some, little rural osteopath in the middle of nowhere in Appalachia and he's just like fire hosing oxycontin pills at his clientele I mean just there's just no way with the demographics of the region and the history of this guy's practice that he is not running an illegal business to like a pill mill in which tons and tons and tons of pills are going onto the black market now remember these pills aren't being manufactured in a black market way these are like like Purdue Pharma and the Sacklers collected money on all the pills that were in the black market, you know, they, they are, there's an initial point of sale and then they're diverted. So sometimes they would get alerts about this. You'd have sales reps inside the company saying, hey, this is a little weird. I think this might be a criminal enterprise. You'd have local pharmacists reporting on dodgy pain clinics. And the answer from Purdue again and again and again was, well, we would never second guess the way a doctor practices medicine. You know, like if, 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 if doctor, <laughs> If Dr. McCrime over here is doing this, like he must have his therapeutic, you know, medical reasons for doing so. Uh, they're very solid. And of course, far be it from us to ever question his integrity. Um, so that comes up again and again. And I think it's this kind of fascinating. I think it's one of the answers for how this whole story could happen is that um, this is true for the Sacklers. It's true for Purdue. Uh, but I also think it's true for any of us. I think there's this tendency, an almost childlike tendency, to when somebody's got a white coat and a stethoscope and a diploma on the wall, you kind of want to put yourself in their hands and believe what they tell you. Because what choice do you have, right? If, you, if you're going to start second guessing them, you're kind of on your own. Um, but boy, I mean, I, I think there are many, many instances in which they, they turn out to be not worthy of that trust. Um, so the Sackler family um, was famous, but not for being um, not for being pharma moguls. Um, this was a very, very well-known name 
in lots of very fancy places. Um, talk, talk to me a little bit about um, the, the, the family's, um, you know, quote unquote, tradition of philanthropy and, um, and, and, and the role that it played in, in, in the sort of building of the family image and, um, and ultimately obscuring the, 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 the true nature of the family fortune. So there's this incredible moment that I discovered in my research that um, if I had written this as a novel, uh, this would be like the kind of scene you would cut because it's too, um, it's too on the nose. Um, but during the, the depression, Isaac Sackler, the father of the three brothers, uh, you know, hit hard times and, and wasn't able to give his sons any money and he kind of gathered them around and he said, listen, you're going to have to finance your own education. I really have nothing to give you. Um, however, I've given you the most important thing that a father can give his sons. I've given you a good name. And if you, if you lose a fortune, you can always earn another one. But if you lose a good name, you can never get it back. And that turns out, I think, to be this kind of rosebud moment in this story, because as soon as the brothers start making some real money, they start wanting to put the family name on things. And you see it in the 50s, it starts at Columbia. Um, they start making donations. Columbia is significantly a university that none of them had attended, but there's a kind of aspirational quality to, to this philanthropy. And um, significantly, <coughs> you know, I think today we see the Sackler name on halls and galleries. And if you squint, and you don't think about it too hard. It just seems like a kind of sort of beneficent gesture by this wealthy family that just wants to sort of add to the, to the civic good. Um, but when you get under the hood and you, and you, and you read the inter-office memoranda at some of these institutions that they gave money to, you realize that there's a lot of strong arming that's going on. There's always this sense of, okay, you're gonna put our name on it. You're gonna put my name on it. Uh, you're gonna use my middle initial anytime you describe the place. You're gonna put MD in my name anytime you describe the place. If you don't, you're getting a letter from a lawyer. You know, if you send an invitation out to an event in the place, you're gonna have my name in it with my middle initial and that MD. Um, and it's this kind of very sort of uh, strong arming, this sense of, um, I am going to give you this thing that you desperately want. And then you are going to give me a whole lot of things that I ask for in exchange. There's a, there's a quote in the book from a longtime attorney for Arthur Sackler when he says, um, if you want your name on it, that's not charity. That's a transaction, that's a business deal. It's, um, it's, it's pretty shocking <clears throat> because when you look at, I was at the Met over the weekend um, to see the Alice Neal exhibit. And um, because I was reading your book, I took a detour through the, uh, the, uh, um, the Sackler wing and saw the, uh, the Temple of Dender, which you really like lay out how that all came together. And, um, and it really is quite shocking to see the name um, on that wall, knowing what we know, there's the, you know, um, the Serpentine Sackler, a Sackler, Sackler Serpentine Gallery in, in London at the Tate Modern, um, you know, the University of Tel Aviv, New York University. I mean, this name is just everywhere. Um, so it's, it's, it's really striking to see the degree to which, um, but when I was at the Met, I was thinking what was, the thing that struck me most was that, um, you know, they were generous philanthropists, but they were also a little chiseling. I mean, uh, it, it was not that much money that they gave to the Met to get that. And yeah. in fact, I think the Smithsonian, they ended up getting, a, Arthur Sackler got a whole gallery with his name, a whole uh, art gallery with his name on it, but ul didn't ultimately give enough money to, to build it. And so they had to raise extra money to, um, yeah. I mean, it was just kind of mind blowing. Right, and it was a struggle. This is the same thing happened with the Met that they, they gave this big splashy donation and got their name on the Sackler wing forever. But actually when it, when it came time to building the, the wing that houses the Temple of Dender, uh, the city of New York had to had to basically pay for construction. What the Sacklers gave was not enough. Um, yeah, this is fairly typical. I mean, there were very often these deals, which to, to, I'm paraphrasing somebody, but there's a Met official who's quoted in the book saying, you know, it was a, it was a very nice gift for the Met and a fantastic deal for Arthur Sackler. You know, not to mention, I mean, there was the the reputation laundering, but also the tax benefits that come with uh, come with a gift like that. Um, um, I'm going to go to a couple of questions in the Q&A, and then I'll continue to intersperse with my own question. Um, um, Sarah asks, um, um, 
a really great question that 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 um, that, that is close to my heart because um, I like you, I'm also a reporter. Um, how did you get access to these emails and all the information in the book? I mean, it's just an astounding trove of um, of inside information that uh, the Sacklers fought for a very long time to uh, to keep secret. So great question. Um, it was a th through a variety of ways. I mean, the this book would not have been possible. Um, I entertained the idea, I wrote this piece in the New Yorker in 2017 about the Sacklers. I briefly entertained the idea of writing a book about them then. Uh, my feeling then was that it, while it would be possible to write a book, I couldn't get close enough to them for, for them to feel like anything but ciphers in a book. Um, I just felt as though I wasn't close enough. I didn't want to write a book where, where the reader felt like they were seeing these people through a telescope. Um, I, I only wanted to do it if I felt like you, you would, you know, you felt like you were in the room with them. And um, so in early 2019, Maura Healy, who's a, actually a big character in the last third of the book, she's the attorney general of Massachusetts. She did something that no other state attorney general had done. Pretty much every state has sued Purdue Pharma over its role in the opioid crisis. Maura Healy sued the Sacklers. She sued a bunch of members of the family who sat on the company's board. Nobody had done that up to that point. And she produced this huge paper trail of stuff that she'd gotten through discovery, all these internal emails. And so when I read those, I thought, there's a book here. That was like the, the kind of tip of the spear. That was like the wedge for me. Um, subsequently, there have been tens of thousands of pages of documents that have come out uh, through discovery in, there's so many different lawsuits, but in this like multi-district litigation, that's going on um, in uh, the various suits about, involving the Sacklers and Purdue specifically, and then also in a, in a bankruptcy uh, case because Purdue has ended up in bankruptcy. <coughs> so I, you know, I don't know how many. Honestly, I, I have I've never done the math. Like I think I, when I was figuring out how to describe this in my note on sources, I thought it would probably be a stretch to say over 100,000 pages of documents, but like not a huge stretch. I, I went through a, a vast, vast amount of material that came out through litigation. I was also leaked a lot of stuff. So um, there were, uh, boy, kind of internal company documents that were leaked to me. <coughs> there were a whole series of very revealing uh, emails among some members of the Sackler family and some members of staff that were leaked to me. Um, somebody who knew Richard Sackler when he was young and corresponded with him uh, sent me original hard copies of his letters that he wrote uh, when he was um, when he was in college, which was amazing to see. He had letterhead, you know, as a freshman in college, um, and uh, but amazing to have those, and I, I get to keep them. I still I still have those letters. Um, so stuff came to me through a whole variety of different ways. Um, the, the, the bigger challenge in a way, in a weird way was, um, I think as a reporter, I, I've gotten better at this over the years, but there's a tendency when you do all that homework to then want to like push it across the table at the reader and be like, look at all my homework. And um, that's deadly. Uh, you know, as a reader, I hate that when somebody's just like, I found all this junk and now I'm going to put it all in my book so that you know all the junk that I found. So the challenge for me was actually, you know, that it's kind of like I read all that stuff so you don't have to, right? The, was sorting through this vast volume of stuff to find the little gold threads. Yeah. I mean, it's really extraordinary the lengths to which the, the family went to conceal its, um, its, um, its, its role here, and and the other thing that's really striking, and this comes across in in the way that you bring these these documents to life, is that there never were really any whistleblowers um, at a high level. Um, you know, you would think that there would be somebody who would be looking at this um, situation and thinking, "This isn't right. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna I'm gonna come out and um, and and you know call the FDA or <laughs> talk to the police or or somebody," but. Um, it, it's almost as if everyone um, involved it was had sort of like imbibed this this same um, Kool Aid that uh, that the Sackler family had for all those years. I think that's right. Yeah, I mean, I was really startled by this in the sense that the 
there are there are, I mean there are a few people you might describe as whistleblowers in the history of Purdue employees, but not many. And generally, when people did speak up, they were they were uh, squat. I describe in the book a number of people who were kind of squashed um, by by lawyers for the company. Um, and it's the same in the family. I mean, this is the other thing that's so weird is the it's not a tiny family. There's a whole bunch of third generation Sacklers who are these like young millennials um, who you know have like hip uh, hip interesting jobs in the arts and happen to to just quietly be worth hundreds of millions of dollars um, that is like totally from the sale of OxyContin. And they they pretty much all, I, th I think like without exception, they pretty, they'll tell a story to themselves and their friends, which is like, well, I was never on the company's board. That's not really my thing. Like I'm not involved in the company. Um, I just have this trust, you know, that makes me super rich and, um, but I don't really, you know, I have no real connection to the, to the money where it comes from. Um, so can we please just talk about my independent film? Um, that's a refrain that, that a number of them have. And there's, I, I had sort of thought that just statistically there would be like one third generation Sackler who would say, I've read the books, I've read all the articles, like, you know, my family company is being sued by every state in the union I don't want the money or like, I'm going to take my fortune and, and give it to harm reduction or, or abatement um, and, you know, or build treatment centers. Um, no one, not a single person. Yeah. There's no Abigail Disney in the Sackler family. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I think you just answered uh, uh, John's question, which is about the, how the, how the Sackler children view their role. And um, um, I think, I think there, there seems to be a great deal of, um, of looking, looking away. Um, um, another question from the audience, uh, do you know if there are any um, conversations happening about removing the Sackler name from all the buildings, galleries, um, et cetera, where it's currently emblazoned? I think a little bit of this has happened, but it, it's still, it's still, still kind of early days. Yeah, I would agree that it's early days. So um, after my piece in 2017 came out, the photographer Nan Golden uh, launched a campaign to try and pressure art museums to take down the Sackler name. And I, I write about Nan, she's a big character in the last section of the book. Um, and she's a fascinating figure because she's, uh, in the eighties, she was very involved in AIDS activism. Um, so she has this like very strong history as an activist. Um, and she uh, is you know, very, very revered photographer whose photos hang in many of these museums that bear the Sackler name. And she's a recovering, uh, she's recovering from an OxyContin addiction. So um, she has this kind of amazing series of qualities that made her, uh, I think a very dangerous antagonist for the Sacklers. And she started leading these amazing protests at, at the Guggenheim and the Met and various places trying to get people to take the name down. Um, what they did succeed in doing is a whole bunch of institutions have said they will take no future money from the Sacklers. A smaller number, Tufts University, NYU, um, the Louvre in Paris, have actually physically taken down the Sackler name and just stripped it from everything. Um, I think there's going to be increasing pressure on a lot of institutions to, to do that. You've got, even the Met has said that they are, I think they're in the process of like reassessing or something. I don't know what the mealy mouthed term that they used was, but um, they've certainly opened up the, the door to the possibility that they may end up, that the Sackler wing may no longer be called the Sackler wing at a certain point. I mean, the, the toll here is, is, is staggering. I mean, we're talking about, um, you know, a couple hundred thousand lives lost. We're talking about people's lives destroyed by addiction. Um, have the Sacklers ever been made to face justice um, as a result of, of, of the decisions that they made and the um, things that their company did? No. Um, I mean, part of the story I wanted to tell, I wanted to tell a very specific story about this family and this company. Um, but I hope that uh, the book makes a larger systemic point, which is when you're worth, uh, you know, 11 plus billion dollars, um, 
it is in the nature of our system that you don't really face the consequences for for you know, anything you do. Um, and they have a, uh, you know, they have an, an army of, of very good, highly paid attorneys who are, are I think, generally pretty mercenary folks, um, some of whom, you got to remember this company, Purdue, pled guilty to, to federal criminal charges in 2007, and then again to federal criminal charges just this past November. And during that whole period of time, the Sacklers owned the company. They were they were really managing it and and um, and kind of intervening in terms of the decision making. So they had a real role in what was happening uh, inside the company, what the company was doing. And during that same period of time, they were taking we now know ten billion dollars out of the company during a period of time when the company was committing fraud, was committing federal crimes. And there are a whole bunch of you know powerful, influential attorneys who represented them before then, represent them still now. Um, and are really going to bat for them at the moment to try and make sure that they face as little accountability as possible. I think that, you know, in the final analysis, they will have to, in order to make all of these lawsuits against them go away, they will have to pay some amount of money. They've proposed it should be um, like four and a quarter billion dollars. Um, it's like 40 cents on the dollar for what they took out of the company while it was committing these crimes. Um, and there are some states that I think are so desperate for funds to address the opioid crisis that they're saying, okay, that's it. Well, that's great. We'll take it. Um, and then others that are saying, that's not enough. That's crazy. Like in what, you know, if, think of leaving aside the idea that if you get busted in some states selling a small amount of heroin for a second time under a two strike law, you can go away for 10 years. Um, you know, in what other criminal context where you commit fraud? Do you get to kind of haggle and say, well, I'll tell you what, you know, if I give you a little money, will you, will you let me keep the rest? Um, so no, I, they haven't faced significant consequences. And uh, in fact, they've never admitted any wrongdoing. Um, there's a moment at the end of the book in, at which two Sacklers are forced to testify before a house committee. This is in December. And Kathy Sackler, who was on the board for years, is asked, uh, you know, if she feels any responsibility for the opioid crisis. And she says, she doesn't feel any responsibility, but she goes beyond that. She says, looking back over all these years, I look back at it now, there's not a single thing I'd do differently. Hundreds of thousands dead, not a single thing you'd do differently. Um, do you think that there have been broader sort of systemic changes? Uh, this is a, a question from another uh, member of the audience. Um, do you see other changes in, um, in place in the industry to prevent this in the future, as in pharmacists needing to report suspicious fire hosing of pills by a few Dr. McCrimes, um, things of that nature? Have, have there been any sort of thoroughgoing reforms? I mean, there, there has been a, there's certainly been a, um, yes. Uh, th there's been a much tighter uh, regulation and policing of um, the kind of lax prescribing that was happening. I think a lot of physicians have woken up to the fact that, uh, you know, once you get people on these drugs, sometimes it can be hard to get them off. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the problem is, and this is, I, I see where we are in the hour and we won't be able to fully exhaust this subject, but I can promise you that if you read my book, I deal with it exhaustively. Um, at a certain point, you have this huge population of people who have become uh, dependent on opioids. Um, and, and it starts to get a little harder to access prescription opioids for a whole variety of reasons, some of them good reasons. And what happens is that um, those people don't just stop because they already have a problem. They already have an addiction and they're terrified of going into withdrawal. What a lot of them do is graduate to heroin and then eventually graduate to fentanyl. Um, and so you have this kind of a funny situation now where the, what the Sacklers tend to say in their defense is they say that the opioid crisis today is not a prescription pill crisis, it's a heroin and fentanyl crisis. But there are studies on this. I mean, I, I cite studies in the book and I have also done a fair amount of reporting myself in which people tell me this anecdotally where a lot of these people trying heroin and fentanyl, the on-ramp for them was prescription opioids like Oxycontin. So the idea, so it's, it's certainly true that the Sacklers do not sell heroin or fentanyl. Um, I would say that it's, it's, it's not true to suggest that they have no indirect causal relationship to uh, the opioid crisis as, as we know it today. 
And in fact, when they reformulated the, the, the pill, um, the, the high dose pill of, of oxy, um, Contin um, after after that guilty plea um, to make it harder to snort or to crush and snort or, or inject. Um, so, you know their their sales went down by twenty five percent, which is um, you know which is. <laughs> I mean, the whole book. I mean, I'm not glad you picked up on that. Nobody picks up on yeah. that. No, it it's wild. Mind. So they yeah. so they make it harder to abuse and sales fall by twenty five percent. What does that yeah. tell you? You know. Yeah, and then they, and they kept on making it. Um, Patrick, I'm conscious that you've given us a lot of your time and uh, that you're also recovering from COVID. Uh, but there's a very important question that we need to get to, uh, which is, um, what is your dog's name? Because your dog is really cute. This is this is from an audience member, not from me. This is this is Shopi. Um, he's a Yorkie, and he is um, he's almost 17 years old. And in, in wow, uh, years. yes, very old dog. He is uh, blind and deaf. Um, doesn't have a lot of teeth. He has no idea that we're talking about him now. But he's <laughs> a very good, loyal dog. Who, um, and, he, and we got him. He's such a tiny dog because when when my wife and I got him, my then girlfriend and I got him, we were we were living in a 300, 350 square foot apartment. So this is the only kind of dog that we were going to possibly <laughs> be able to uh, to accommodate. Anyway, well, he's a cutie. Um... Uh, last last thing in the in the chat is 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 more of a comment than a question. But I think it it's something that that uh, that that we should share. And it's a, and and Carol Stout says, I hope that your book helps all of us see addiction differently, not as awful people with no willpower. Um, and I think that uh, really speaks to I think the story that you tried to tell in your book about how um, a lot of folks ended up suffering really quite needlessly um, because of the terrible negligent actions of one very very greedy family. Uh, I, I mean, I, I completely agree. And, and Carol, I, if, if, uh, if the book is able to do that in any small way, um, that'll mean a huge amount to me because I do feel as though it's one of the, it, you know, it's one of the kind of compounding injustices, right? Is that you have a lot of people who are suffering and then they, they suffer from the added stigma of having, having been called, in, in Richard Sackler's words, the scum of the earth. Um, so if there's, if there's anything I can do to, uh, to offset that kind of, um, uh, that kind of idea, then uh, I'll, I'll, I'll feel like I've done a good thing. Great. Patrick, thank you so much and um, feel better. Thank you. Thanks so much for doing Thanks this. For your book. Thank you all for joining us. All right. Yeah. Good night. Yeah. Um, Patrick, Lydia, what a pleasure to welcome the two of you. And thanks for both of you for this engaging conversation. And thanks to everyone who tuned in to join us this evening. Please uh, consider purchasing a copy of Patrick's new book by visiting us at pals.com. While there, please be sure to check out our lineup of other or upcoming virtual events. We look forward to seeing you at another one of our events again soon. Patrick, Lydia, thank you again. We're very grateful for you to coming. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>